So I want to just start with uh, talking about this island. Um, just to give you an idea of, <clears throat> of what placemaking is, because placemaking is, is very common, but it's not something we think about very much. So, so for me, islands are kind of a microcosm of a much larger, of much larger places. And so by looking at an island like this, we can get actually a, a more simplified idea of, of placemaking and maybe then think about how it applies to much larger places than this little island. The island that I'm talking about is kind of unique. It's called Pulau Mabul, meaning Mabul Island in Malay. And if you look at the tourism literature, what you see is what you have here on the left. This picture here, Sabah, best of Borneo, Sabah, Malaysia. And it shows Pulau Mabul here, and it shows two floating resorts, five-star resorts for scuba diving, right? But if you get a different perspective, looking at it from the other side, you see this, which is very different. It's um, showing you what the real island looks like. You can't, so in this picture here from the Sabah, from the Malaysian Tourism Bureau board, uh, you do not see the large Filipino population occupying this side of the island. Uh, in fact, there are three different places on this place. Um, one of them is here, you see here. Another is much of the in this interior part and these resorts here. And then there's another village actually right here that we're going to take a look at too. So three, three places in this little place called Pulau Mabu. Pulau Mabul is located here in this part of Malaysia. This is, uh, this is the island of Borneo. This is the northern tip of Borneo, and the Philippines is just off um, to the upper right. Indonesia's here to the south. And Mabul, the reason Mabul is interesting is because it's the gateway to Sipadan Island. Sipadan is considered one of the top scuba diving places in the world. If it's often rated number one on world rankings as the top place to go scuba diving. And these are some pictures that I took diving at Sipadan uh, myself. But Mapulau Mabul is how you get to Sipadan. It's where everybody stays and then they go next door to go scuba diving in Sipadan. And so for those international tourists, they have five-star resorts like these. This one is on the island itself, uh, and then these are the two that are that are built on over the over the water over the coral. And you see, there's a couple kids here, so you have this type of place. You also, I didn't, I never stayed in any of these. <laughs> they have more smaller, more uh, modest accommodations as well for uh, for divers, which is where I typically stay. But those two kids are part of this community. It's Kampong Musa. Kampong means village in Malay. And they are a Bajau Laut community. Uh, Bajau Laut are, are sea gypsies. They are found throughout Southeast Asia. They do not have any nationality. They don't have, they're, don't, they're not Indonesians. They're not Filipinos. They're not Malaysians. They're not Thai. They're found in all those countries. Um, and they basically, they, they migrate uh, from one place to another uh, and have these fairly, you know, kind of barely put together buildings. <laughs> but they are somewhat tied in to that tourism industry. You can see how close they are to these, uh, this five-star resort. And you can see up here, there's a little shop here that says, that offers refect reflexology, foot and body massage, manicures, and laundry service. And so there are, and there are a couple little shops here in this Bajau Lao community as well. These sea gypsies are kind of interesting. They have developed, they can, they can stay underwater for really long periods of time. They're physically, they're biologically, they have a large, very large spleen that they are born with nowadays, which allows them to hold their breath and stay underwater for long periods of time to collect food. So they're kind of a unique population found throughout Southeast Asia. 
The other village on the other side, the much larger, which is kind of downtown <laughs> uh, Palau Mabul, is Kampong Mabul. It's a Suluk community. Suluk means part of from the Sulu Sea, that, which is the Philippines. So these people all came from the Philippines. They're all illegal immigrants in, in, in Malaysia. They're not supposed to be there, but they have a fairly large community. Um, in Sabah, about a million, they have this, there are about a million illegal Filipinos living in Sabah, a quarter of the population. So they're, they don't have any legal status. The Malaysian government does not provide schools. This is a school of hope. It's a volunteer school. This is a scuba diver here. Scuba divers volunteer their time and to, to help the kids with English and, and other things. Um, there are scuba diving homestays. There's scuba diving places within this community. Those are usually run by Malays um, because if you are not if you're an illegal Filipino, you cannot be a scuba dive instructor uh, or, or guide, um, which is what a lot of these children would like to grow up to be, but they can't do that because it's against the law. <laughs> so place making on Mabu, you've got these three things. You've got this, you know, this Sulu community, you've got this Bajau Laut community, and they don't in interact because the Bajau Laut, because the Suluks consider the Bajau Laut very inferior culturally. Uh, the Bajau Lao children have no school. They never attend school, uh, even though the the the, um, <clears throat> the Sulu kids do have that school of hope. Uh, and then you've got these resorts. I stayed in this one here. You can see it's, it's not quite five star, but it's, it's a, quite nice. So placemaking on Pulau Mabul. You, Pulau Mabul itself is a place, but it has three distinct places. These are affected by the physical geography context of that place. Location in the tropics is a very small and remote island, tropical climate, but it's in the Coral Triangle, which is like the richest scuba diving region ecosystem in the world by far. And it's right next to Sipadan. It's the gateway to Sipadan. People cannot stay on Sipadan. They stay on Mabul and then they dive at Sipadan. Um, then, but then there's also this human geography, the agency of these diff three different things that are happening, creating places. There's the Malaysian influence, the Philippine influence. Indonesia is also really close to here. here. Indonesia was fighting to have make Sipadan part of Indonesia, but they lost that in, in the world court. So you have history, culture, politics, migration, and mobility of all three of these populations uh, that come together in this particular island. And you have that global dive the global economy that dive tourism. These three coexisting places in this very small place. Um, Doreen Massey, the geographer, referred to things like this as thrown together togetherness, a word she coined, <laughs> where the apparently unrelated is related and connected. Um, so the dive industry does provide jobs mostly for the Suluks. The um, Bajau Lao basically uh, rely on themselves. Mostly fishing is the main way uh, that they get, um, uh, feed themselves. So that thrown togetherness. <clears throat> Here we see some divers getting off a boat, get either on or off a boat. This is a hut, a hut that's basically for them. Uh, food might be served in there. Um, and here's some Bajau Lao kids. Uh, the boats, Bajau Lao, for the Bajau Lao population, the boat is the single most important thing they own. <laughs> so, <clears throat> oh, and there's me with the bump head parrotfish. So, placemaking. Everyone does placemaking. Everyone on that island was contributing to making the, the, those three distinct, unique places that were thrown together to create this place called Pulau Mabul. Placemaking, I'm gonna have several definitions of what placemaking is, here's one. <laughs> uh, placemaking is creating places through the daily placemaking actions of inhabitants. This is a picture, I actually got this off a Japanese government website that was trying to show how everybody in this picture, everything in this picture is contributing to creating this place. Uh, it's the humans, the different 
activities that different humans are involved in, farming, fishing, and um, recreation activities, also economic activities, but it's also the non-humans, the plants and animals and trees and biology that, can, that is part of this place. Uh, and there's, I guess there's a festival going on here, transportation, all of these things come together to create a place. And in many ways, this is what traditional geography is all about, is places, understanding how places come into existence. So that's one definition of placemaking. Um, defining placemaking through space and place. So I'm going to go into a little bit of geographic um, theory here. Space is basically everything that surrounds us on the surface of the Earth, there is outer space, but we're talking about surface space on the Earth, is connected in some way. This is Walter Tobler's first law of geography. Everything is connected to everything else, except some things that are closer to each other are more connected than things that are further away. This is a really key element of understanding geography and understanding how things are related to each other. Yifu Tuan, um, the humanistic geographer, he says that space is constantly being created through the activities that we're involved in. Those activities basically means movement and perception. <clears throat> we move through space and we create space. We move objects through space, and that's how we create space. But we also perceive space. We perceive things as being away from us. We're here, that thing is there. That, could, that thing could be another person, it could be a city, it could be another country. Um, and that creates space through our perceptions. So space is actual and, ima and is also imagined. We, can Im we imagine space. It also comes through our senses, the creation of this space that surrounds us. A couple of characteristics of space, it is always changing because our activities are always changing. What we are doing as individuals, as, as societies, as countries, that we're always, those activities are always changing. Think of what the world is doing now, all the activities that take place between different countries and different parts of countries and how different that is from what it was just a few years ago. Things are always changing for various reasons. In addition, space is always uniquely experienced. The space that I experience is different from the space that each single person in the room <laughs> or at home watching this is experiencing. Everybody has their own experience of space. We have shared space, yes, but even then our experiences are unique. So place is the other characteristic, and uh, this is the cover of Yifu Tuan's famous book, Space and Place, The Perspective of Experience. Um, Tuan defines space, places as a, assigning significance to certain parts of space. So there's a certain part of a space, and we give it a name, and we say this is important for one reason or another, or we don't like it for one reason or another. That's how we create places, according to Yifu Tuan. People demonstrate their sense of place when they apply their moral, that is what's right and wrong, and aesthetic, that is what's pretty and what's not, what's beautiful and what's not, and ugly, discernment to sites and locations. That's how places are created, out of, out of that ubiquitous space that's everywhere. So space and pay, place are things that are co-created through our human actions. And by doing that, we create identities. We create identities for ourselves, our history, our experience with space and places, and we create identities for individual places. That's part of that significance, is that identity creation. So here's another definition. This is my definition of placemaking. <laughs> Producing, designing, crafting, creating, bringing into being the material and experiential elements of a place landscape. Material is physical. You can see it, you can touch it, but it's also an experience. So how do we, how do, we do that, you know, bring that into existence? Well, in fact, humans do this naturally, <laughs> but we don't have to really try, we do it, but we can also do it intentionally. 
So Tuan identif- call, uh, defined two types of places in his writings. One he called public symbols. Others refer to this as pu- the public sphere. Um, other, other philosophers. This, these are significant, they were the significance, the importance of a place, the name and its importance are assigned by a large group. Some kind of a group says this is import, important. This is, these are usually very easily understood. When we see them, we know that's probably an important place. Um, monumental buildings, large structures, public gardens and plazas are examples of these public symbols, public spheres. The opposite of that is what Yifu Tuan called fields of care. Other people refer to it as the private sphere. And this is where the significance of the place is assigned by an individual or a small group of some kind. And sometimes you need special knowledge to know that place is is significant. Um, If somebody didn't tell you that this was a sacred mountain, for example, you would never know that that was a sacred mountain to that particular culture group. But examples are a home, a private garden, maybe a local park or neighborhood. People, you know, assign these kinds of significant things to uh, in various ways, but usually this is off. This is the private sphere. Well, in terms of place making, um, and I'm going to talk about the different ways that I write place, different different types of place making. There are also two types of place making. One is master plan, top down themes, images are often global. And it's a significant part of what urban planning and urban design are involved with. Architects are more involved with the urban design. Urban planners are more the city planners. That is mostly related to this public sphere. Planning, government involvement, or some, somebody who has a lot of money <laughs> creating these public places. The other is place making, which I you, I sep- this is one word, this is two words. When you look at the literature, it's really hard to tell because people use both spellings for both things. But in general, this is more commonly re- applied to, to urban planning, and this is more commonly applied to cultural geography. These are not planned. They're bottom-up individuals, lo- local people are doing this, and they're creating places through this sort of, the main difference is this is kind of bottom up and this is top down plan, bottom up non-planned. And this has been the focus of cultural geography studies for for many years. Um, As an example, I'm gonna take you to Hailing Island in Guangdong province. And I'm guessing most of you have never heard of this place (laughs) because it's it's not a very big island. Uh, Macau is over here. Um, Hainan Island is over here, the northern part of Hainan Island, to give you some idea if you're familiar with southern China. This is Hailing Island, this little island right here. This is a, a, here it is on Google Maps, this is two kilometers. So it's, it's mountainous in the middle, so it, I mean it does take a little bit of time to get to, from one side to the other side, but it's still um, not, not huge. <laughs> It, it does have a 5A, that's the highest ranking you can get, beach. And that's this beach down here. This is this, their 5A ranking beach. Um, I'm also going to, I'll take you, first I'm going to show you some of the resort activities that are mostly along this beach area here, from, from like this area here down to this area, this area down in here. And then I'll show you this town here. Uh, Jop, Jopo is the name of it. Jopo Jun, this, this town here. So, Hailing Island. The main thing of Hailing Island is real estate development. These are second homes. There are six major, huge second home developments on Hailing Island. Each one specializes in something different. That's what this chart here is showing. I be, believe the first one is beaches. Uh, The second one is other recreation, like swimming pools and other sport activities. And the third one is shopping 
and, um, rec and entertainment type recreation, and one of them specializes in that. As you approach the island, this is not even getting to the island yet. It's just nothing but real estate signs, advertising real estate. This is the place I stayed in when I was there. Um, some people from Sun Yat-sen University uh, took me there. This particular resort specializes in golf. <laughs> um, this is this is the, the main kind of commercial area. They have commercial activities on the bottom floor. We have we're staying in uh, in an uh, apartment. It's kind of like Airbnb type rentals at, at a pretty high level. They also have individual houses that are part of their development. And you can also see the beach down here. There is a small village over here as well, <clears throat> but this and this is all commercial stuff here. But um, interestingly, this place was pretty much empty. You know, there's been a lot of talk recently about. Um, that um, big real estate company in China that's going bankrupt. Yeah, I bet some of them, they own some of this stuff, and <laughs> built some of these things here on Hailing Island because mostly they were empty. Um, they do fill up during the holidays, but during most of the rest of the year, there was not much there. This is a set, a second, another one, and you can see new buildings going up. These buildings, these apartments sell before the building is built. Um, that's the, how high the demand is for these second home types of places in China. This one's kind of far away from the beach. The beach is way over here, but they've got they've got um, this shopping center that they're building, the shopping mall, and they've got this recreation areas. One of this is like a karaoke building. Another one is like a, um, games, different types of electronic games. Each building is devoted to a different type of recreation activity. Another one is a movie house um, that's surrounding this, this lake that's part of, uh, that's adjacent to the shopping center. So that's their big selling point. Uh, here's the 5A beach, Dajiao Bay. <laughs> um, and Silk Road, oh, the Marie, Maritime Silk Road is connected to this. Uh, there's a big museum with some things related to the Maritime Silk Road. But this is the part of the beach area. All of this is top-down planning, either by the government, which is the beach, or by private developers. This is bottom-up placemaking. This is Japo uh, City and Harbor. Uh, it's a big fishing harbor here. This is um, aquaculture, mostly oysters oyster beds over here and the city here. So there is some real, <laughs> not bot, not top down, but some places that have been created bottom up. Uh, one of the main things people go from the resorts here for is seafood. Uh, this is a restaurant that serves tourists. And there's several of these that you, is actually connected to the land and you walk out to these floating restaurants. But they also advertise uh, these boat trips that you can take on fishing boats. And this is a fishing boat that we went out on one. They drop the net and drag the harbor as they're, as they're uh, taking you out on the boat ride. They caught one fish <laughs> and a bunch of other kind of junk stuff. But um, it's to experience to this boat uh, harbor fishing traditional place. Fishing is a big deal here. Um, these are bigger fishing boats that go further out into the South China Sea for, um, to catch their fish, and then they bring them in at the harbor. Um, and in town, there's the wet market. This is the market on the outside. People are selling vegetables and, and such. They also sell on the inside. Uh, but seafood is really huge at this particular place. So there's that also. This is more that, that bottom-up placemaking. In between, you have another kind of placemaking. And I use the third way of spelling this was place space making. So instead of a dash, instead of one word, I use this the fuller word placemaking. And this is where you have a mix of things for tourists and um, for locals. This is a tourist market. But you can see a, a lot of the food things, you know, some of this is more more toys and things for tourists. 
but a lot of the food stuff is, of course, used by locals as well. And oops. okay, and and then they have at least one of these. This is the one that I was taken to of a gentrified tourist village. This is an old Chinese village, but it's been fixed up really nice. Um, these are all accommodations. These are all houses uh, that people can can stay in. And they're very well done. They're air conditioned and, and really nice furniture inside. And again, this is the kind of mixed place making. It's mixing the old, the traditional uh, with the new um, kind of upscale type of experience. So this comes from my book, my article published in Tourism Geographies in 2017. This is a small portion of a, a larger table, but showing the differences between this top-down placemaking and this bottom-up placemaking and the placemaking that's in between. And I would say, you know, there's kind of an ex a continuum here. There's very few places that are 100% top-down. Those like Highling Island was kind of an exception, I think. And there are very few places that are 100% bottom up. Instead, most places fall somewhere in between this continuum. But some of the different characteristics, the drivers have changed top down versus bottom up, more collaborations in the middle. Uh, the symbolism is more global versus traditional in, in the bottom up, more global in the top down planned process versus more spontaneous development in the bottom up, co-design public participation in the middle. Security is very predictable, very safe in top-down places, more uncertainty and risk, and but also more surprise in bottom up places. In tourism sociology, this is sometimes referred to as the front region, and this might be referred to as the back region. Authenticity, uh, the top down is, is definitely much more inauthentic in fantasy, disnification, whereas the bottom up is more authentic and real, and placemaking is something in between, uh, this PM uh, middle part. Transformation is very fast versus very slow change over here on bo bottom up, and the top down is very fast change. Um, Tourism area life cycle, there's differences. Capacities tend to be different. The experience, more recreational in top down, more experimental, existential in bottom up. And you're more involved with the market branding in top down, and you're more involved with the site, the actual site itself in bottom up. So I think you can see the, the differences. Top down placemaking. This is a diagram I created. <laughs> Somebody at the top is making the decisions and basically imposing them on people at the bottom. Bottom up is just the opposite. People on the bottom are making the decisions and that's what gets created. Um, ideally, there should be more of a collaboration um, in terms of placemaking, of people, of communication going both ways, bottom up and top down. And that does happen in many places as well. China's kind of an exception <laughs> in terms of the degree of top-down that you find there. Okay, so we talked about placemaking and defining placemaking, different types of placemaking, those three different types. Now, I argue that tourism is always top-down. Tourism placemaking is always a top-down process, even when you're turning a bottom-up place into a tourist attraction. The planning process from the tourism, people who are involved in tourism is always top-down. And um, I think that can be a safe argument. So I'm gonna now focus specifically on this top-down placemaking. This type of placemaking originated with urban design. That's how it originally came into being, it was something, a subject area called urban design. It was a subject area that I was very interested in when I was working on my master's in urban planning. Urban design was what I wanted to do. <laughs> and I'm still doing it in some ways. Old urban design was focused on architecture and city form. 
Uh, you had gateways to welcome the gods, boulevards and plazas for military access. And this is all Euro-American kind of focused walls, although I think they do have applications in other parts of the world. Walls to keep resources in and to keep threats out. Um, <clears throat> street grids for military access in Europe. But in the US, you had street grids, everything in a grid shaped pattern to sell land. That was the reason you had those grids in cities throughout the US. Public parks for recreation by the elites. Originally, it was only the elites that used these public parks. Of course, today it's different. And marketplaces were for the working class. The elites did not go into the marketplace, just the working class did. So that's a traditional approach to understanding the historical development of cities, especially in Europe and the US. But I think a lot of this also applies to other parts of the world. Uh, Kevin Lynch was probably one of the most influential people in terms of urban design and urban planning. Um, his book, The Image of the City, came out in 1960, focusing entirely on how people perceive and behave in cities. And he identified that can, you can basically take the city apart in terms of the paths that, are, that exist, edges between districts, nodes where people and things come together, and landmarks. Those are the main parts of the image of the city. But again, that was urban design. There we go. Urban design today is placemaking. Uh, that's basically what, play, what urban design is. I think it started becoming placemaking even when I was back at, as a graduate student. Um, although, because my master's thesis was basically focused on urban design, but relating it to tourism. And so um, basically that's what I was doing. <laughs> uh, place, this is another definition of placemaking. Placemaking is creating quality places where people want to live, work, play, shop, learn, and visit. This comes from the PPS.org, which I'll introduce here in a second. Um, that's their definition of placemaking. Uh, it is used by architects, landscape architects, urban planners, and government. And it is focused on sidewalks, public squares and parks, streets and boulevards, large streets, semi-public places, which may be some building lobbies and shopping malls, and other recreation areas. This is an example from Suzhou, China, of a street uh, that has been placemate, place made into a, a tourist attraction, but also a shopping area for local people. Uh, it's, it's completely upscale. What's kind of nice about this is they only did it on this one side. On the other side, there's the, still the old residential area. And while it's mostly walled, you can't really see into it much. Every now and then there's a little gap and you, you got to kind of get a sense of maybe what this street looked like when it was re a real street. Uh, but now it's um, a place made street. It's made into some place that, that is attractive. I should, shouldn't say it's that, that's bad. It, it helps to make this area someplace where people want to live, work, play, shop, learn, and visit. Um, urban design. This is, as I, this is a way I'm kind of introducing this whole concept of urban design. Pub, this is public space looking at the sidewalk. The sidewalk is one of the places that, that, that we look at in terms of urban design and placemaking. And did you know there are four parts to a sidewalk? <laughs> uh, the first part over here on the left is the frontage zone. That's the part that's immediately adjacent to the buildings. It includes the signs, overhangs like this, and any furniture and other signs that are, and also the front of the building itself, what it looks like, what the, the walls look like, the colors and everything. That's the frontage zone. The second zone is the throughway zone, and that's the pathway that people walk on. Um, and you, in the general rule is you want to keep it open, as, as open as possible, so people can feel comfortable walking. The third is the furniture zone, and that's all of this stuff that's in between where people are walking and where the cars are. The, a lot of this is very functional furniture. Um, there's also you can also have um, benches for people to sit on, but it's mainly one of the major purposes 
is to for people who are walking here to feel protected from the cars because cars can feel very threatening um, depending on how close and how fast they are to this throughway. And then the third, fourth place is the edge zone where you go from the sidewalk out into the street. And especially in intersections, that's a big issue on it, just how you design that so that people can feel safe. So that's next. Um, so this part on placemaking, a lot of the images I'm going to show come from this book, Placemaking as an Economic Development Tool, which is from the state of Michigan governor's office. It's like the, the biggest, most, the best resources I, resource I've ever come across on, on placemaking. Uh, also, I draw on the, the Project for Public Spaces, pps.org website, and that's where that, that the other definition came from. And so that's a website with all, a lot of information about placemaking. So I just wanted to give uh, no, notify, you know, let you know about these references that I'm using. So the next part I want to talk about is different types of placemaking. Um, this again comes. This is based on this book. There's actually there's standard placemaking, which includes everything that's being done here. Creative placemaking, tactical placemaking, and strategic placemaking. There's a fifth type of placemaking also that I will introduce that was not in this book, which was, I thought, very interesting <laughs> why it was not there. So we have these four types of placemaking. And remember, these creative, strategic, and tactical placemaking, they're all part of this standard placemaking. Standard placemaking is all forms of community improvement from the most simple to the most elaborate. Anything that a government does to improve the look, the feel, the safety, um, the efficiency of the streets, public spaces is considered placemaking. Sometimes it, it, this, it just looks like this, and it's not really tur involved, it specifically focused on tourists. It's more uh, focused, this is more focused on pedestrians making the street feel safer for pedestrians. But it can be focused on tourists. This is public uh, space, place, standard placemaking in Key West, Florida, which in the downtown Key West, Florida is a huge tourist destination. Um, it, it's the southernmost town in the Florida Keys, southernmost island. So it's like the southernmost place in the, for, in the continental part of the U.S. But you can see, you know, the sidewalk's nice and wide. There's a quite a lot of, of uh, things in this furniture space, including trees and, and various things to help the pedestrians feel safe. Uh, but there's also a lot of attractive things seen of, of, of in the shops. And the colors is mostly white and blue. Um, so there's a kind of a theme to these colors as well. This is the same thing in Macau. Um, picture I took at night in Macau. Um, again, these things here are designed to help pedestrians feel safe walking down the street. <laughs> um, but the, all these lights are part of that uh, that placemaking. Um, so this isn't really creating, you know, a tourist attraction, but it is making the place feel uh, more um, more interesting for both locals and tourists. So um, again, well, again, I think I was just showing you. Now, now we're going to look at creative placemaking, then we'll look at tactical, and then we'll look at strategic. So creative placemaking is using art. It's art to make places more interesting. Uh, this is uh, Shizuzhou Island in Taipei, <laughs> which is kind of a, uh, an island um, in the middle of the river in Taipei. It's, it's, it's a flood area, and so it hasn't been really developed, but they have put a fair amount of art and things, you know, bicycle paths and things to make it a recreational type of space. These are some students from the university um, that I was there on a field trip with. And this person here with, with her, with the victory symbol, that's actually my wife. So, just creative place making in Xi'an, China. Uh, the wild, the, the great wild goose pagoda, where the, uh, the Buddhist monk 
brought scriptures from India back to China to translate is still there, preserved, but everything around it has totally changed <laughs> and it's been, has, has been enhanced by these different types of art in the ground uh, and figures like this um, in the areas around it. It's, um, it does attract a lot of people. A friend of mine who's more of a historian thinks it's, it's really terrible what they did here. <laughs> they really destroyed it, but, um, but it's an example of creative placemaking. Standard in creative placemaking in Sweden, uh, this, is, this is along the river in Sweden. This is more standard placemaking, making it feel more comfortable for, tur for locals and tourists alike. And this is more the creative aspect. This used to be a fishing harbor. And so the people selling fish and doing things related to fish are shown in these statues. So, number, so that's number two was creative placemaking, using art to create a, a place, sense of place. Tactical placemaking is often placemaking that's done somewhat illegally, <laughs> but it's, it's doing things in places that were not designed for what is being done. This is in Hong Kong, and I thought this was a great picture of tactical placemaking. Hong Kong, as you know, is one of the most densely crowded places in the world. And this is on a Sunday, and you only see this on a Sunday. On Sundays, Filipino maids have the day off. And so they want to gather with their friends, and this is how they do it. <laughs> they're underneath a covered walkway here, so they're protected from rain. They have some umbrellas. This day it's not rainy, it's sunny, so they're protected from the rain and the sun. And they put cardboard up like this to kind of mark off their little space for them and their friends. That's tactical placemaking. It's temporary. It's not going to last. It's, you know, questionable how legal it is. <laughs> um, some other tactical placemaking, the two up here in Riga, Latvia, and Guadalajara, Mexico, are the creation of bicycle paths by local residents. This bicycle path here was not there the day before. Suddenly, the next day, it was there <laughs> because the residents went in and painted it overnight illegally. Yeah, probably. And here again, residents are creating a bicycle path on a road. Um, this is not necessarily illegal. It started, this trend started in San Francisco and sometimes it was illegal. They basically would take over parking spaces on the side of the street and create, turn them into parks. Often they were just temporary um, parks. They're called parklets. Nowadays, many cities have this, even where I live in Flagstaff, a business owner can pay the city for the money they would lose by losing the parking spaces, and they can create a space like this for the public in front of their business. Farmers markets like this, this is the farmers market in Flagstaff before the pandemic, but even during the pandemic, it was very popular. It happens every Sunday, and it's in a parking lot. So the parking lot is not used on Sundays, and so on Sundays, they turn it into a farmer's market. And this is found you know, throughout the US nowadays, um, these, these weekly uh, farmer's markets like this in spaces that are not, uh, not needed um, on that particular day. Cool. So that's tactical placemaking. It's sort of a bottom-up type of, of, uh, of placemaking where people, the, actually the locals are wanting to create something that they don't have. Um, is often the way it's seen in spaces that are not actually being used effic that efficiently. Um, so the last one is strategic placemaking. And again, these are all things that are fall under the whole category of standard placemaking. They're all things that are done to create, make places more interesting and fun and um, pretty and lively. Uh, this is Heritage Square in Flagstaff. This is where I live. I live down several blocks down the street that way. Um, this, when I moved to Flagstaff in 1986, this was not here. Instead, what was here was a very large, like four-story empty department store. It had shut down, gone out of business. Um, 
and it was just this empty, ugly thing in the middle of downtown Flagstaff. <laughs> downtown Flagstaff was not very pretty at that time. There were a lot of secondhand stores and a lot of empty buildings. Downtown, it was not able to compete with the, shop, the new shopping mall on the outside of town, on the edge of town. So the city went in and said, well, what are we going to do with this building? They tore the building down. Uh, they kept one part of it that was historic, and that's still there. That's actually where I'm standing taking this picture. But they built this plaza instead called Heritage Square, which is now the center of downtown activity. There's, during the summer, there's always activities going on here. There's um, concerts that take place. There's dances that take place. There's markets that take place in this Heritage Square. So they created this place to be the center of activity to change downtown. And downtown Flagstaff today is a huge tourist attraction. I mean, there's, there's so many restaurants and bars. <laughs> it's hard to, hard to imagine this was once a dead place. And on this particular day, they've actually closed this street off and they brought, brought snow in. And so they turned it into a snow playground for this particular festival that's going on. So that's strategic placemaking, is creating things like this. This is in tai, Taichung in Taiwan, the city of Taichung. Here they've taken an old railroad area of the city, which is, was no longer in use, and they've turned it into a public art space. So it's strategic and creative. It's a very popular place. There's also lots of food that you can get in this place. And there's a lot of art displays that are, that are often changing and then a couple of large art galleries. You can see some of the buildings here are also decorated with art um, in this particular part. So another example of com combining strategic and creative placemaking uh, in this case. So we've looked at creative placemaking, tactical placemaking, strategic, and they're all kind of within this standard placemaking. When you overlap these strategic and creative, it, it affects the physical form. Tactical and strategic can, can affect land use activities and functions, and creative and tactical can create social things. And so, for example, <clears throat> strategic and creative, the physical form are the buildings here in this particular picture here on the cover of this book. The um, land use functions, those are the shops, the different types of shops. What types of shopping, what types of services are you offering to people? Uh, what type of things where they, they can do? The social opportunities are found here. These are people, this is a restaurant, it looks like, of some kind. They're, they're drinking, at least. But they, where you have spaces where people can get together. They might, they might be part of the restaurant, or they might actually just be a, a public space. And so you can see that, how this physical form, land use functions, and social opportunities all come together here um, in, this, uh, in this picture. And that is urban design. And that's how we create quality places. Uh, through through urban design, urban planning, landscape architecture, and architects are all involved in this. Tourism, there's one huge thing <laughs> related to tourism that is not covered in that book. That book was designed for urban planners. It, it, I took a workshop at the American Planning Association on placemaking, and that's where I was given a copy of that book and, and uh, learned all of the, a lot of this stuff. But the one thing that I just found it was so curious that this type of placemaking was not described. I call it story placemaking. It's the fifth type. Authentic, there's two types of stories. There's authentic stories and there's mythological stories. Authentic stories are the history and heritage of a place. People are drawn to the history and heritage of a place. They're drawn to places where famous people and events took place. It's also the marketing image that's, that a place creates for itself. And it's also, I put social media reputa reputation. How do people in social media talk about a place? That's part of the story of that place. There's also mythological storytelling, fairy tales, ghost stories, fiction novels in the past. The new form is entertainment, movie tourism, and I put food tourism here as well. 
although that's probably something in, maybe in between the two. The example I show here is the broken bridge in, in um, Hangzhou, China. It's a mythological story. Uh, the battle of the bro that says here after the battle, Bai Zhu Su Shen Jun meets Xu Xian on the broken bridge. <laughs> um, so this is a story about this snake goddess who came down from heaven, the Chinese heaven, came to earth, took on a human form, married a human, a mortal, and had a baby. And she didn't want to go back to heaven. And the heavens, the gods in the heavens sent uh, other gods down to bring her back. And the biggest, the big battle in that whole story took place at the Broken Bridge. And this is the Broken Bridge. Probably one of the most famous tourist attractions in China <laughs> for Chinese. Uh, not only is this a fairy tale and ghost story, but it was also a, a very famous movie that came out uh, several decades ago uh, that was very popular in China. So I, <clears throat> by most standards, you would ne never know that this was a, a huge tourist attraction. This is where it is here. Uh, this is Hangzhou and this is Westlake. But that's an example of story, story um, placemaking. Uh, Another example, John, St John Steinbeck is a very famous American author. He wrote a book called Cannery Row in 1945 about Monterey, California. In it, he said he described Cannery Row as chipped pavement, weedy lots, lots of weeds, junk heaps, junk cars, sardine canneries. The canneries were all processing sardines of corrugated iron, honky tonks. Those are bars, restaurants and whorehouses, prostitution. That's what Cannery Row was back then. This is Cannery Row today. <laughs> Cannery Row is a huge tourist attraction, jam-packed. Every time I've been there a few times, and every time I go there, it's just full of tourists. And there's also there it is. There's also an element of strategic place making here. The Monterey Bay Aquarium, considered one of the top aquariums in the U.S. It was uh, when it was built, it just kind of reshaped what an aquarium could mean. It was like the first aquarium in the US to really redefine what an aquarium can do. Uh, it is located actually here in, I think it's down at the end of this street here. Uh, there it is, aquarium, yeah. Um, and so that helped as well. So, <clears throat> so you have some storytelling placemaking and some strategic placemaking. <clears throat> Tourism placemaking is marketing in many ways. Uh, this is a company called Creative Concern, a UK-based marketing company. And they do placemaking and tourism. And basically they do marketing campaigns, powerful campaigns, engaging narratives and compelling propositions, among other things that they do. And the Singapore Tourism Board says one of the things we do is placemaking. They do marketing, industry development, and placemaking. And how they describe placemaking, the Singapore Tourism Board, together with various agencies, precincts, and private stakeholders convene in a coordinated effort to, to spearhead development and implement various placemaking initiatives, such as festivals, marketing initiatives and infrastructure improvement. So festivals, marketing and infrastructure, which is that basic, you know, that really simple placemaking with the aim of improving visitor experiences and inject vibrancy to bring the precinct into life. There are four precincts that they work on. Two of them are cultural, Chinatown and Little India. And two of them are lifestyle, which means shopping mostly, Orchard Road and the Sentosa Harbor front. So placemaking is uh, one of the things that the Singapore Tourism Board does and probably a lot of other tourism boards do, although they don't necessarily um, market it in that way. So tourism placemaking is urban design, it is marketing, and it's also activities, shopping, recreation, and entertainment. This is the 10 plus concept of placemaking from pps.org. Uh, they suggest that a city or a region should have 10 major destinations within it, ideally. And so they use Manhattan here as an example. 
Each destination should have 10 things that people can do, <laughs> 10 places that people can visit and see in each destination. And each of these places should have 10 or more things to do, layered to create synergy, to create, create diversity. That's, their, that's sort of a, a fairly uh, a, a model. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a generalization, but it's one that one can consider. So what are the tools of placemaking to create those things that we just saw uh, in that last slide? Well, I put them into these three categories, tangible, physical design, and intangible mental image tools, and then something in the mix called people practices. The tangible is the landscape and the built scape. That's the street furniture, the sidewalks, the plants, the colors, public monuments, those kinds of things, which is the focus of traditional urban design. The intangible is more that storyscape, the mindscapes and storyscapes, branding and marketing, history and heritage, those myths. This is more what tourism people, scholars, <laughs> and people into tourism are really much better at uh, focusing on, that the business side of, of things. And then there's this mixed people practices, ethnoscapes and peoplescapes, festivals and special events, street life, local dress, um, the sounds and smells, entertainment. A lot of this is, is um, bottom up. It's what the local people are doing with this place that they have, um, that they live in. Uh, this is on Pinterest, placemaking ideas on Pinterest. Uh, and you can see most of this is, is more urban design oriented. But I, I tried to increase the size of the categories that are at the top of this page. Uh, giant outdoor games, urban parks, Jane Jacobs, places, bus stops, real estate development, urban intervention, Dallas and Baltimore, for some reason are big in this page, public spaces, oh, Montreal is another city, streets and interactive installations. Um, I suppose this game here and the slide are more on the interactive side. And more on placemaking tools, placemaking tools in Key West, Florida. I was in Key West, Florida a few years ago and took this picture and I thought to myself, wow, this picture brings all of these things together, <laughs> all of these placemaking things. This is Key West, Florida. This is classic Key West, Florida. The colors, pastel colors, the theming of water and palm trees, famous people. Well, you may never heard of, have heard of Jimmy Buffett, but this is Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville Cafe. <laughs> Jimmy Buffett sang a song called Margaritaville about losing his girlfriend and going to the Caribbean and getting drunk. <laughs> so, and it's a very famous song. And so there's the Margaritaville Cafe and Jimmy Buffett. The way people are dressed, um, the signs, the street life, the parrot, <laughs> the building facades, you can see some in the background here also, walkability, touchability, the lady touching a co-creation. This lady has surf on her t-shirt. That's a co-creation. She's enhancing the theme of Key West and then the plants as well. So I thought that was, that was a lot of things come together in that picture. So, Placemaking is not without its critics. It's not, it's something that has, um, it's not always necessarily considered a good thing. Some people are, are opposed to this whole concept of placemaking. So the first debate of the two that I'm gonna ra raise is what happens to sense of place? Sense of place is something that is often associated with uh, bottom up, you know, traditional culture, you know, you really feel that there's some really strong roots in this place. Um, there's the, the book Place and Placelessness that came out back in the 70s that really brought home this whole idea of what is the place that has a strong sense of place? And what is the place that 
is placeless. That means it could be anywhere in the world. You have no idea where you are when you're in many shopping malls, for example. So placemaking increases homogenization, the sameness, the lack of diversity. It increases placelessness, the globalization, the lack of localness. It increases disnification. Disnification is predictability. There's few things that are more predictable than Disneyland. The lack of surprise. It increases McDonaldization, which is another predictability, but it's the idea of control, um, the lack of spontaneity. So there's no increase. So you're losing diversity, localness, surprise, and spontaneity. Um, Ritzer, Ritzer and Liska in 1997 called this McDisneyfication, all of this stuff up here. Hyper efficient, predictable, and controlled. And in many ways, that is what tourists seem to want. <laughs> you see this in theme parks, you see this in cruise ships, shopping centers, theme restaurants, historic shopping street, streets. These are all hyper-efficient, predictable, and controlled. So it seems like tourists want this. And so I guess why not create it? This is on Hailing Island. One of the resorts there advertises life in Hawaii and Frozen. That's the two themes that they use to sell this resort. Um, this is in the tropics, the subtropical, the most tropical area of China. <laughs> so Hawaii maybe might fit, but Frozen? <laughs> well, anyway, whatever will sell, right? They know their market. The second major debate topic is ownership, power and ownership. Who owns this new space that's been created? Who has the power to create this? Development, change, and control. Who defines what is success? Uh, is success meaning you've driven out all the poor people and all the only rich people live there? Um, maybe. <laughs> Conservation, preservation, and heritage. Whose story are you going to tell? Whose history? Most places have a complex history that's layered with many different, um, different peoples, different cultures that have come into play. So whose story is the true story? Commodification and hyper-consumerism. -consum Commodification, you're selling that place. Basically, you're turning it into a product for tourism. Who owns that tourist landscape? Uh, this is a quote from pps.org. Which people do we want to gather, visit, and live in a vibrant place? Is it just some people? Is it already well-off people? Is it traditionally excluded people? People are usually excluded from the place. Is it poor people? Is it new people? Is it people of color at different ethnicities? Those are questions that often, when it's top-down, you, know, you don't get to ask those kinds of questions. Um, an example, this was from the news just a couple days ago, That I, although it's been in the news for a while now. Political heritage placemaking top down. China is removing domes from mosques as part of a push to make them more Chinese. They're removing, this is one of the, the most important mosques in China, the Dunguang Great Mosque in Xinin, China. All three, this, the big dome and the two small domes have been removed. They're no longer there um, to, as of today as of last week, I think. Authorities say the domes are evidence of foreign religious influence and are taking down overtly Islamic architecture as part of the push to sinicize historically Muslim ethnic groups to make them more traditionally Chinese. So obviously, you know, who's in charge? <laughs> who's deciding this? This is a placemaking act, um, a very overt placemaking act. So the question, then is, is there, how do we get to a balance in between? And actually the pps.org, that's what they're trying to do as well, is find this balance between that top down and bottom up. Um, I call it organic placemaking. I also call it sense of place placemaking, <laughs> where you have both placemaking, the bottom up natural evolution of places, indigenous, homegrown, vernacular, that means local, and you have top-down placemaking, planned, guided, supported by government. 
if you want the government's involvement, it's going to have to have, there's going to be some top-down activity. PPS.org's quote here, great places are not created in one fell swoop, but through many creative and individual acts of citizenship. So is this possible? And I'm looking at Japan <laughs> as one of my favorite places as it, where I think this might be happening. Better here, better, I think I've seen better examples in Japan than just about anywhere. Um, this is a historic preservation on Mitorai on Osaki Shimojima in the Seto Inland Sea. And my question is, is this organic placemaking? Uh, this is historic preservation. It's kind of a tourist place. Um, you, there's a tourist map here showing different, the major sites. Um, Mitorai used to be a, an important stopping point for sailing ships, but once the steam engines took over, it kind of got bypassed. But so it has that heritage of being in a, a, of a former um, seafaring sea town. Um, but just a few pictures. Um, sacred and the Profane. This is the entrance to the, 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 the temple area in Mitarai. And let's see if I get that other. Oh, there it is. And this is the entrance to the, the prostitution, house of prostitution in Mitarai, which is still maintained as a heritage place. Uh, you also have hints of traditional livelihood. Of course, the population, as in much of rural Japan, is significantly declined. There aren't very many boats, but there are some, and there are some older men out there fishing as well. And so you get a, a little bit of that, that hint of the, of the past. Um, and I was also really impressed with the fields of care. I, these basically what people do to their houses, uh, having some plants outside, and these kinds of designs, art things on the outside of their house where where people are doing things that are actually become public symbols. They're private, but they're also public at the same time. Everything in just the right place. That's what I felt like in Mitarai, and I feel like that in other parts, especially in rural, um, rural Japan, that everything is just in its right place. And you don't feel that in many other places, <laughs> believe me. Uh, the temple bell tower uh, of the temple. Um, and to try to understand this, I've looked at the concept of Sato, Sato Umi, which is um, related to Satoyama and Satoka, Satoko. Uh, his historical definition of Sato Umi is a coastal fishing village supported by the fisheries and coastal waters surrounding it. That's the historical definition. So a fishing village supported by all the activities that take place. The modern definition is preserving traditional coastal communities as integrated cultural and ecological production, in this case, fishing landscapes. Um, the goal is to maintain or restore, maintaining or restoring a balanced and sustainable harmony between humans and the national, natural environments. Mostly using an ecosystem services model, which I don't really like because that's based on money. If ecosystem services models are basically everything comes down to money. <laughs> and so to me, just being able to see some people out there fishing was enough to get that sense of what this place was like. From an ecosystem services model, that's not enough. You have to have, you have, to have a fishing industry that actually makes money of some kind. So I, I'm not really crazy about that particular approach. But, um, but overall, other aspects of Sato Umi and Sato Yama, I think, are very attractive. For example, these are management concepts uh, from Sato, Yu, Sato Yama and Sato Umi. The integration of nature and humans, harmony among e the different ecosystem services, cooperation, uh, land and cultural management, those all sound pretty good to me. Sustainability, environmental sustainability, bio biodiversity, carbon sequestration, cultural preservation, ecological knowledge, inspiration, spirituality, and rural regeneration, productive fishing. This is really a tough one, I think. Productive fishing and agriculture. But tourism, recreation, and leisure seem to be, in some places at least, an alternative to that productive 
uh, fishing and agriculture, which can uh, which can be hard to to really make it a, a, a significant economic activity. So I'm I'm kind of I kind of think this has potential, <laughs> but um, but I guess time will tell. Um, so in summary, this is my last slide. This is how I think of placemaking. Everything, people and places, want to be the best expression of itself that it can be. That's their identity. People want to be what, their identi what they ident identify as. Places, I think, also want to be that. It's more of a social, a group uh, concept of identity. Um, we're always making choices about what, oh, I, but everything is always changing creating opportunities to form new identities. The world is constantly changing. Everything is always changing. <laughs> you can't stop change. Things are either going to deteriorate if you just leave them alone, or if you work on them, you can fix them up, but change is going to happen. Um, and every time change happens, we should look at that as an opportunity to form new identities, to evolve identities of people and of places. Um, so we're all, and then the second concept, we're always making choices about what our newly emerging identity will be. We're constantly making choices. We make choices thousands of times a day to decide we're going to do this and then not this. We're going to turn left. We're not going to turn right. We're going to eat this. We're going to not eat that. We're going to, you know, take this type of transportation to go shopping and not that other type of transportation. We're constantly making choices. Some of them are big choices, but many of them are really small choices. Every time we make that a choice, we are doing placemaking. We are favoring one thing over another thing. We're favoring one pathway through a place over another pathway through a place. We're basically it, uh, contributing to placemaking. The thing is, we're seldom aware that we are doing that. We've, we've, this is a concept, you know, that urban design people, planner, urban planners, architects, urban ar landscape architects, they all know this. They all, this is really a huge part of those professions. Beyond those professions, almost nobody knows about it. Um, Especially, I don't know, in the, well, maybe, I guess there's some people in tourism, like Singapore Tourism Board. Um, but, you know, the general people, you know, they don't realize that how much their daily personal actions are creating the world in which they live in. To become aware is to become empowered to create with purpose. So if we do know this, you know, we can, that can be an empowerment. Everyone does placemaking all the time. So that's something to consider. And that's, what, of course, one of the reasons why people don't realize that that's, this is what they're doing. Um, this is a picture in uh, Yamaguchi in southern uh, Japan. I spent a couple months there on my last sabbatical before I retired from NAU, which uh, and really loved it, living amongst these rice fields. It was really nice. So, let's see, stop sharing. Okay, so I'm open for any questions that people might have.